Hello and welcome to Morning the Narrative. I am McBulo. The show will feature the top news of the week, complete with my observations, and even a little bit of snapcasm thrown in. The top news stories will be taken from my morning news briefings that I write on the, on the Rick Bulo new media blog every weekday morning. If you go on to like what you see, smash that thumbs up button. And now, let's go right into the news. 20 days after the presidential election, there are still hearings going on. As a matter of fact, there is a hearing going on today in the Arizona State Legislature on the 2020 election. Wisconsin had already certified their their electoral votes for Biden. And there's an article that I had, had found that that said that if if voters had known about eight stories that the media had ignored, Trump would have won. This coming from our good friends over at the Daily Signal. The head of a media watchdog organization says the media's failure to cover eight stories may be the reason President Donald Trump lost the election. The media can talk all day long about Donald Trump and all day long about things that he's doing wrong, Brent Bazell founder and president of the Media Research Center, said on a call Tuesday unveiling a poll the center commissioned, special report, the stealing of the presidency 2020. It is absolutely unequivocal, the evidence that it was a national news movement that deliberately, and I it deliberately, made it a point not to tell the public about these stories that nobody can question, Bazal said. And now we're showing the evidence that it caused Donald Trump the election. The Media Research Center asked voters about eight news stories the center considered important topics that are ongoing analysis had shown that liberal news media had failed to cover properly. According to, an, according to a report by Rich Noyes, the research director of the Media Research Center, the eight themes included the three negative ones about the Biden-Harris ticket, including Senator Kamala Harris's liberal viewpoints in the, sexual, in the sexual assault allegation former Vice President Joe Biden faced, and the five positive to- stories about the Trump administration, including 33.1% economic growth in the Middle East peace deals. In whole, the survey found that 17% of people who cast their ballot for Biden would have changed their vote if they had been aware of one or more of these important stories, according to Noyes. If the eight votes had been, or if the eight stories had been reported on, Trump would have won every single contested race in America, Bazal said. Of the six contested races, he would he would have won every single one, and he would have had at least 311 electoral votes. The Media Research Center commissioned the polling company to survey 1,070 people who voted for Biden in seven swing states. Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Six of these states appear to have been won by Biden, with North Carolina being the, the exception. The survey found that 82% of people who voted for Biden did not know of at least one of the eight stories. For example, the survey found that 35.4% of people who voted for Biden did not know about the allegations from Tara Reid, who said Biden sexually assaulted her in the 1990s. In a May statement, Biden said the allegations from Reid were false. I want to address, to address the allegations by a former staffer that I engaged in misconduct 27 years ago, Biden said. They aren't true, this never happened. Noyes writes, if they had known about Tara Reid's sexual assault allegations, 8.9% told us that they would have changed their votes, either switching to Trump or a third party candidate, not voting for any presidential candidate, or not voting at all. By itself, this would have flipped all six of the swing states won by Biden, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, Pennsylvania, and, and Wisconsin, giving the president a win with 311 electoral college, college votes. Noyes also noted that the lack of media reporting on the Trump administration's success to her appears to have had an impact on voters. The five pre-election jobs reports from June 5 to October 2 showed a record 11,161,000 jobs were created in the extraordinary snapback from the pandemic recession, Noyes wrote, adding, yet a large number of Biden voters, 39.4%, said they didn't know about this achievement. If they had, 5.4% say they would have changed their vote. This would have swung Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin to Trump, 
who would have won with 295 electoral votes. Adam Brandon, president of Freedom Works, a grassroots political organization who joined Brazil on the call, said the media's findings illustrate the media with said that the survey's findings illustrate the media's influence. It's very clear the media was not objective in following this race, Bannon said. This was a complete failure of the fourth state at the national level. I believe their polling results alone should embarrass and embarrass them enough to start to relook at their model. Of people who voted for Biden, 45.1% said they did not know about the question business dealings of Hunter Biden, the son of Joe Biden, where the New York Post alleged in an October 14 piece that an email on what was believed to be the younger Biden's laptop indicated Hunter Biden had introduced a Ukrainian business executive from Burisma to his dad. Hunter Biden served on the board of the Ukraine-based natural gas company. One polling question read, at the time you cast your vote for president, were you aware that evidence exists, including bank tra transactions the FBI is currently investigating that directly links Joe Biden and his family to a corrupt financial agreement between a Chinese company with connections to the Chinese Communist Party that was secretly intended to provide the Biden family with tens of millions of dollars in profits. Among respondents who voted for Biden, 45.1% said they were unaware of this. During the final presidential debate in October, Biden defended his son saying nothing was unethical about Hunter Biden's position on the board of Burisma. My son has not made money from China. The only guy who has made money from China was this guy, Joe Biden said. Of Biden voters, 9.4% said they wouldn't have voted for Biden had they known. Flipping all six of the swing states he wanted to Trump, giving the president 311 electoral votes, according to the Media Research Center. The scandal, I think, per points to perhaps the, the largest scandal in history, where the government is concerned where the allegation was that the vice president of the United States was, in fact, lining his pockets with shady business deals with Chinese communist companies, Bazal said. The Biden laptop reportedly confirms all that. So you would have thought that the same media that were going hog wild during the Kavanaugh hearings, when there was no evidence of it, would go crazy over this one. And in a sense, that is true. I mean, I did report uh, on this very thing last week. So if you want to go back and check out last week's Week in Review, I think, uh, I think it was Wednesday or Friday that I had spoken on it. You know, just check that out. And I mean, it, it just goes to show the, the gross media sycophantism, if that is such a word, over Biden and, and the Democrats and not much toward Trump or, or even, the, even the, the, the Republicans. And, and it shows with this article from Legal Insurrection I can pull it up here. Media pivots from steady news stream of Rana Trump hashtag face news to Biden Stopperfest. This by Fuzzy Slippers and posted Saturday. From Russia, 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 an orange, an orange man bad to pet psychics, cat exclusives, and sock choices. The media has been protecting Democrat presidential nominee and former Vice President Joe Biden and treating him with kid gloves. Among other stories, they colluded to smother the New York Post bombshell report on Biden family influence peddling, and they acted like it was perfectly acceptable to ask a presidential candidate what flavor milkshake he ordered on the rare occasion he left his basement to, to, to campaign. While I doubt we'll be seeing any magazine covers with Biden sporting a halo as we did of Barack, Taiwan, Obama, it seems that the media intends to drop the anti-Trump conspiracy theories, falsehoods, daily doses of outrage out outrage, and general alarmism that have for four years undermined their already shaky credibility with the American people. Instead of fake news, it appears we will be treated to countless fluff pieces from quote-unquote journalists who would be right at home donning a, a goofy hat and doing yoga on morning television. Let the media slobber fest over Biden begin. Biden, the Boston Globe gushes, is a devout Catholic who always carries a rosary in his pocket and leaves his speeches with scripture. 
Well, the field I mentioned, however, is, is that Biden particularly really likes a book of poems written, he imagines, by the palmist. And this is a tweet from Benny Johnson, oh my heavens. This is Joe Biden's Thanksgiving Day message. He has no idea what the Psalms are. He calls them the palmist and then looks confused. So humiliating. Fred Hume tweeted out, he apparently thinks King David was a palmist. Also on Saturday, we were treated to a fascinating interview with the pet psychic who got the skinny on what a quote unquote great president Biden will be. Dot, 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 from his dogs. Pet psychic Beth Lee Crowther said Joe Biden's dogs, Major and Champ, told her they are excited to live in the White House. They also say their mess will be a great president. This from the Daily Beast. And the hard hitting reporting doesn't stop there. Sit down for this one. Should Biden be installed in the White House, he'll be taking a kid along with his two dogs. Greg Polowitz tweeted out. Journalism is back, baby. This, this letter, mind you, is a CBS quote-unquote exclusive. Meanwhile, top journalists are doing the hard work of reporting the color of the socks Biden wears on his little footsies. George W. Bush was known for his socks. Maybe Biden will be too. Today he wore dark, dark, shot, dark socks adorned with lighter blue dogs. Yes, there will be plenty more substantive things to tweet about, but we can have fun sometimes too. This from Jennifer Epstein. All that's missing is the segment or article in which journalists share Biden's favorite recipe for chicken pot pie, a Biden family favorite. We are breathlessly told by the Washington Post. Yeah, I mean, it just goes, it just goes to show the complete 180 and difference that the news media today is as opposed to what it was back in the 60s, 70s, and possibly even early 80s. You know, I, I mean, it, it's just mind boggling and mind blowing that the media would be fawning over all this. But regardless of all that, we we got this from the Epoch Times, which says that there is no president-elect as of yet. Why? Because the president-elect is not decided until the Electoral College votes, according to Senator Blunt. Senator Roy Blunt, Republican Missouri, on Sunday declined to refer to President or to, to Democrat presidential nominee Joe Biden as president-elect saying that while Biden's team now has access to transition funds, the title will, will only be formalized if the elect, or after the Electoral college, college votes next month due to contested election results. In an interview with CNN State of the Nation, Blunt, chairman of the Congressional Inaugural Committee, explained that the process of electing the president-elect, a title the former vice president has adopted in his Twitter bio, will last into early next year. Well, the president-elect will be the president-elect when the electors vote for him. There is no official job of president-elect, the Missouri Republican told CNN's Dan Abash. A number of news outlets have declared Biden the winner of the 2020 presidential election. The Epoch Times won't declare a winner until all results are certified and any legal challenges are resolved. Now, while media outlets can make their own projections as to the winner of the election, State electors and the Electoral College are the bodies which are officially tasked with declaring a presidential winner. Each state has different deadlines for when of officials may certify their election results, and the Electoral College votes on December 14. The joint session of Congress will then meet the votes on January 6, 2021. The president-elect te technically has to be elected president by the electors. That happens in the middle of November and then January 6. I'm one of the four members of the Congress that participates in the joint session that decides that those electoral votes are fully accepted, Blunt added. And of course, that is when this process is over, when those votes are elected and counted. When asked by Bash whether President Donald Trump is quote unquote undermining the democratic process by questioning whether there was voter fraud, Blunt said, I think the democratic process is strong and can certainly survive this discussion. Of the legal challenges by, by the Trump campaign and, and others, 
Bunt said we were about at the end of that process. When the states have certified, when this process is over, that's when you come to a conclusion, Blunt continued. That's why things are set up this way. With that, that's why these things are set up in that way. Trump's campaign and, and Republicans have filed a flurry of lawsuits in battleground states, citing evidence of voter fraud, with appeals in some states expected to escalate to the Supreme Court. Blunt said that Trump has a quote unquote big role to play in the coming weeks for, 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 for Republicans. I have certainly encouraged the staff to look at the transition now. Look at the opportunity in India and Georgia to help us win these Senate seats. Look at what the president can do. If the president is leaving the White House, as he said he will do if he loses the Electoral College votes, to help us win back the House in 2022, he said. The president vowed to prove that he won the 2020 presidential election. After the General Services Administration, or GSA, indicated in a letter that it, had, that it had made some transition resources, and there's a PDF of the letter, available for Biden. GSA Administrator Emily Murphy in her letter explicitly stated that the presidency has not been decided and that the winner of the presidential election is still to be determined by the electoral process as detailed in the Constitution. Murphy also added that she was threatened to announce the start of the transition process prematurely at, before independently deciding to issue the letter on November 13. Our case strongly continues. We will put up, we will keep up the good fight and, and I believe we, we will prevail. Trump wrote in a Twitter post last week, the leader of the Voter Integrity Project and former Trump Dan and Strategy Director, Matt Brainyard, Bra or Brainerd, found over 1,000 voters in Georgia who listed themselves at addresses that were that are post offices or other facilities. The post office leases were owned like FedEx or, or, or UPS stores. And there's a there's this photo via NTD. Election integrity, election integrity researcher Matt Brainerd, Brainerd who is also a former Trump official, said in a November 29 tweet, that he was contacted by the FBI for evidence of potential crimes in the 2020 election. The evidence was collected by the Voter Integrity Project, VIP led by Brainerd, from the Data and Strategy Director for President Donald Trump's 2016 election campaign. By Tuesday, we will have delivered to the agency all of our data, including names, addresses, phone numbers, etc. he said. His account was backed by the Amistad Project of the Thomas More Society, a conservative nonprofit profit that says it retained Boehner to conduct the work. An FBI spokesperson told the Epoch Times that in keeping with DOJ standard practice, the FBI neither confirms nor denies the existence of any investigation. Blunt, meanwhile, told CNN's best that while he doesn't believe the election was rigged against Trump, there were some things that were done that should not have been done. And I think in every, and, and I think there was some element of voter fraud as there is in every election, but I don't have any reason to believe that the numbers are there that would have made that difference in the outcome, Blunt added. He praised Trump for pushing efforts to secure the election, like having Homeland Security encourage states to use paper ballots. I think the system, frankly, was more secure than it's ever been before, and the president deserves some credit for that, Blunt said. And yeah, so things are still going on at a fever pitch with that. And earlier in the article, it said that the Epoch Times won't declare a winner. So if we go to the Epoch Times site, you will see that they have the results at 232 votes, electoral votes for Trump, and 227 for Joe Biden, and and they're you know due due to due to all of the challenges here and, and whatnot, but. Yeah, so it's, things are getting hot and heavy and steamy with, with all this. I, w I might talk about the 
about the, the Arizona State Legislature voter tomorrow. Uh, yeah, so there. And with all this going on, there is talk of President Trump calling an end to, of Section 230 of the con of the communications thing there says here that Trump calls for an end of Section 230, saying big tech is a national security concern. This is from Sarah A. Carter. Last night, Donald Trump accused Twitter of conservative discrimination and called for an end of Section 230, which offers a degree of, Im of immunity to the social media platforms for any content uploaded by third parties. For purposes of national security, Section 230 must be immediately terminated. That was in a tweet from Friday by, by the president. Section 230 has been criticized by Trump and Joe Biden, while social media and tech giants claim that it is critical to their continued existence. Still, no, still, still though, critics of the big tech giants pointed out that because Twitter, Facebook, and Google, for example, operate as publishers, they no longer deserve immunity from content re-uploaded by third parties. Why isn't Biden corruption trending number one on Twitter? Biggest world story and nowhere to be found. There is no single quote unquote trend. Only negative stories that Twitter wants to put up. Disgraceful section 230, the president tweeted October 28. Trump has accused social media sites of censoring conservative voices, including his own, but while Biden told the, told the, told the New York Times, the law needed changing as the platforms have played a key role in the spreading of viral misinformation. President Trump tweeted on Friday, Twitter is setting out totally false trends that have nothing to do with what is really trending in the world. They make it up and only negative stuff. Same thing will happen to Twitter as it is happening meaning to Fox News daytime. Also big conservative discrimination. In October, Trump accused Twitter of censoring tweets that had to do with Hunter Biden email conspiracy or controversy. Why isn't bank corruption trending number one on Twitter? Biggest wall story in the way to be found. There is no trend, only negative stories that, Trump, that Twitter wants to put up. Disgraceful section 230, the president tweeted October 28. Twitter has repeatedly flagged Trump's tweets by adding warning labels, claiming the information in the tweets is misleading. Trump's battles with, with censorship has been ongoing and has escalated in recent months. Trump called for a repeal of Section 230 back in May, but is now emphasizing the importance of repealing the act. On Twitter last night, Trump wrote, they and the fake news working together want to silence the truth. Can let that happen? That is what communist countries do. And that's so very true, I mean, you know, we see all this going, going around and we hear a lot about, about this Section 230. Nobody has really, really done anything about it, but, and I know that I might just do a little something on, on that, probably soonish, but yeah, I mean, you know, with, with, with everything going on in the news, with major news stories, bottom line, mainstream media and even social media, you know, the big tech, social media, Twitter, Facebook, Google, they're wanting to put out what they want to put out and ignoring what is really going on in the world. And that's why you have me here at Rick Bulow New, New Media. That's why you have people who follow the Andrew Pepe tradition, like Patriot Soapbox, We Are the News Now, you know, like Sarah Carter, like Tracy Beans, Wayne Dupree, and a few others that are actually putting out the news that really matters. And let me know in the comments section below what, what what you think about all this, and I'll and I'll see you in the next one. Yesterday was the 
a hearing in Arizona for election fraud. And there were four takeaways from there. I got this from a good friends over at the Daily Signal. And it's entitled, Four Takeaways from Arizona Election Fraud Hearing on the same day that Arizona certified former Vice President Joe Biden as a winner of the state's 11 electoral votes. State lawmakers held a fact-finding meeting on Monday on, a, on, alleged, on, on, on allegations, rather, of voter fraud that might have tilted a closely contested state. Biden appears to have won the traditionally Republican-leaning state by just over 10,000 votes. However, witnesses told state lawmakers that mail-in voting fraud and problems with the Dominion voting systems machines could have skewed the results. Dominion has, vig has vigorously defended its machines, stating on its website, according to a joint statement by the federal government agency that oversees U.S. election security, the Department of Homeland Security, Cyber Security, and Infrastructure, in or Infrastructure Security Agency, there is no evidence that any voting system deleted or lost votes, changed votes, or was in any way compromised. The government and private sector councils that support this mission told, called the 2020 election, quote unquote, the most secure in American history. The event is not a formal legislative hearing since the legislature is out of session, but Republican members of both the state Senate and state House of Representatives participated on the panel, asking questions of witnesses. The event, which began in late morning and ran well into the evening, wasn't held at the state capitol, but rather off at a high regency hotel in Phoenix, with the Stop the Steal rally of supporters of President Donald Trump going on outside. The purpose of this public hearing and inquiry into the integrity of the election that just passed is to provide a form where no others have been permitted for the president's litigation team to present the evidence and testimony, said Arizona State Representative Merrick Fincham, a Republican who organized a hearing, adding, we are caught between the desire to trust the process and the suspicion that it has failed the people of Arizona and potentially the people of our sister states. If there is voter disenfranchisement, we must identify its source and eradicate it as we would any diseases. The following are four highlights from the Arizona legislature's hearing. Number one, 35,000 fraudulent votes. If the allegations are true, the biggest news to come out of the forum was the possible addition of 35,000 illegal Democrat votes. Retired Army Colonel Bill Waldron, a cybersecurity expert, testified that an anonymous email from a Pima County tech provider alleged that 35,000 votes were illegitimately given to Democrat candidates in that county. He wanted to remain anonymous, but had enough concern that he wanted to send this to the criminal division of the U.S. Department of Justice, Waldron said. He did not want to be included in the investigation, but the information they recorded is what we would like the opportunity to investigate on your behalf or for an unsick team of your choosing. It doesn't matter to us. Now, if the allegation of illicit voting or illicit votes is true, then the 35,000 votes would be more than three times enough votes to flip Arizona to Trump. However, the anonymous individual is apparently thus far willing to, or unwilling, to provide a name or sign an affidavit under penalty of perjury. So this coincides with the data analysis or a a analytics at that, that spike. We weren't aware of this email until after the fact. So there were approximately 35,000 fraud votes added to each Democrat candidate's vote totals, Walden told their lawmakers. He read from the message that said, the candidates impacted include county, state, and federal election candidates, and talked about the alleged 35,000 votes added for Democrats. The anonymous person also alleged Democrat party members invited him or her to a meeting on September 10 and outlined a plan to add those votes. The message from the anonymous person displayed on the screen said, when I asked how in the world will 35,000 votes be kept hidden from being discovered, it was stated that spread distribution will be embedded across the entire registered voter range and will not exceed the registered vote count. And the, the 35,000 was determined allowable in Pima County based on our county registered vote count. It was also stated that, voter, that total voter turnout versus total registered voters 
determine how many votes we can embed. Maricopa County embed totals would be substantially higher than Pima's due to embeds being based upon the total number of registered voters. When asked if this had been tested and how do we know it works, the answer was yes, and has shown success in the near Arizona judicial retention in the election since 2014. It's even un even undetectable in post audits because no candidate will spend the, the kind of funds needed to audit and contact voters to verify votes and the full potential of total registered voters, which is more than 50,000 registered voters. Still, Walden said he would, he would prefer the person to identify himself on the record and, and under oath. We hope this individual would come forward and issue this as an affidavit, but this is significant. And we also noted that the re reporting numbers from Pima, from Pima and Maricopa counties merged election day votes with write-in votes with absentee ballots, Walden said. So there is no way in the publicly available data to parse those votes into the segments. Number two, certifying Biden. Top state officials, including Arizona's Republican governor, Doug Ducey, announced the certification of Biden as a winner of the state's 11 electoral votes. The governor tweeted today, we signed the canvas for the 2020 election in Arizona. I'm grateful to voters, the county elections office, the county recorder's offices, and the poll workers across the state for their dedication to the success of our election system. Arizona House Democrats marked the hearing in a tweet as a meaningless waste of, a, of time at a downtown Phoenix hotel and called for state residents to focus on the certification of a Biden victory and other election results. However, during the hearing, former New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani, Trump's personal lawyer, spoke out against efforts to certify the election with so many unanswered questions. A former federal prosecutor even suggested it, it might be illegal to certify the vote. The vote as it presently exists is false, it's fraudulent. If they certify it, they are certifying a false statement to the United States of America. Gosh, when I was a prosecutor, that was a federal crime, Giuliani said. Now it's clear that the numbers are false. It's clear that you have included ballots that are improperly inspected. It's clear that you are including ballots that are voted by other people. Giuliani, a former U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, continued adding, it's clear that you are using machines that have been shown to be totally manipulated in other places. And if you won't give us the opportunity to examine those machines, I think anybody who puts their name on that is getting very close to committing a crime. Number three, quote unquote, is your power. Moreover, Giuliani stressed to the American le or to the Arizona legislators that what the governor and secretary of state say might be irrelevant. He said in 1892, the U.S. Supreme Court clarified that Article 2, Section 1 of the United States Constitution gives state legislatures the sole authority to select their representatives to the Electoral College as a means of providing a safeguard against voter fraud and election manipulation. It's your, constitution, it's your constitutional power solely. The clause doesn't say governors, it doesn't say Congress, it doesn't say newspapers. It says state legislatures, Giuliani said. The Supreme Court has said you can back, or you, you can change that and take that power back anytime you want to because it's your power. It's not theirs. Whatever power the governor or the secretary of state thinks they are, they are exercising isn't theirs. It's the legislature's. You can't take it back. At that, those in attendance at the forum began to, to cheer. Based on evidence, you can make a determination. What is the right count? How can we get as close to the right count as possible? If we can, then have the courage to select that person to get the electors, because that person won the honest vote, Giuliani said. He told the assembled state legislators not to fear the media's wrath and that if they determined the real accurate vote, then history, history would view them as heroes. I'm going to ask you to fight. I'm going to ask you to implore the other members of your legislature to stand up to this, Giuliani said. Do not be bullied. Do not be frightened. Your political career is worth losing if you can save the right to vote in America. That also prompted applause from the audience. Jenna Ellis, another of the president's president, per, or personal attorneys, stressed they weren't asking lawmakers to reverse the election, but to investigate fraud and determine if the election or if the results are legitimate before appointing electors for Biden. We're going to ask you as legislators to reclaim that authority and to make sure that the people of Arizona and indeed the people of the United States of America as a whole are not disenfranchised by corruption, Ellis told the panel. 
She quoted Founding Father Alexander Hamilton in Federalist 68, noting that state legislatures are the safeguard against corruption. You are the last step to make sure that this election is not corrupted, Ellis said. We are not asking you to step up and overturn an, an election. We are asking you to step in to make sure that the corruption that occurred here does not stand. However, the Arizona Republic newspaper reported that it would be un highly unlikely for the legislature being out of session to reconvene to appoint a new set of electors. That's because it would require a supermajority to call the legislature back in this session. The GOP governor can, could also call the legislature back, but he has already agreed the state should, should certify Biden as a winner. Number four, absentee ballots, duplicate ballots, and 130%. The Trump legal team also prevent, presented information from the Voter Integrity Fund, playing an audio of several calls to people recorded as having requested an absentee ballot. Each said that they did not do so. Another witness for the Trump team was, Sil was Shiva Ayadurai, a former Senate candidate from Massachusetts an entrepreneur and an engineer offering expert testimony on technology and data. He presented data asserting the only way for Biden to have statistically cut up with Trump after trailing him early on was that the, was that the registered Democrat votes were 130% in favor of Biden and negative 30% for Trump. He showed, on a chart, he showed a chart on the screen to, to explain the findings. What's extraordinary about this graph is, again, we went through many, many iterations. It matches perfectly, near perfectly. I told the Arizona state legislators, the slopes match, the curves match, the shapes match. So what this tells us is that the demographic distribution of allocation of petty affiliations is what can generate this. I find it highly implausible because this means that Mr. Biden got 130% of Democrat voters and Mr. Trump got negative 30%. Anna Orth, a Pima County resident and Republican election worker, testified to the committee that she was denied the chance to observe about 2,000 duplicate ballots. Now, du duplicate ballots are usually ballots that are somehow unclearly marked and require further inspection, typically by observers from both parties. I was specifically taken out of that room, ushered out, and brought into another room, was told the state law lawmakers. And that's true. As a matter of fact, today there is another hearing. I think it, I think it, I think the hearing is in Michigan today. But yeah, so so they're still going on, and based on that. There is one newspaper, the Epoch Times, that is not calling any election until all legal challenges are done. And as a matter of fact, there is one where Pennsylvania lawmakers are lawfully or are formally introducing resolution to dispute the 2020 election results. This from the Epoch Times. Republican state lawmakers in Pennsylvania on November 30th introduced a resolution to dispute the results of the 2020 election. The text of the resolution, first previewed in a memo on November 27th, states that the executive and judicial branches of the Keystone State's government usurp the legislature's constitutional power to set the rules of the election. Officials in the executive and judicial branches of the Commonwealth infringe upon the General Assembly's authority under the Constitution of the United States by unlawfully changing the rules governing the November 3, 2020 election in the Commonwealth. The resolution states, and there is a link to, to the PDF right there in the article. The resolution calls on the Secretary of the Commonwealth to withdraw the quote unquote premature certification of the presidential election and delay certifying other races. It declares the 2020 election to be in dispute and urges the U.S. Congress to declare the selection of presidential electors in this commonwealth to be in dispute. Members of the Pennsylvania General Assembly said in, a, in the statement, a number of compromises of Pennsylvania's election laws took place during the 2020 general election. The documented irregularities and improprieties associated with mail-in balloting, pre-canvassing and canvassing have undermined our elector process and, as a result, we cannot accept certification of the results in statewide races. We believe this moment is pivotal and important enough that the General Assembly needs to take extraordinary measures 
to answer these extraordinary questions. We also believe a representative oversight duty as Pennsylvania's legislative branch of government demands us to reassume our constitutional authority and take immediate action. The proposed text lists three steps taken by the judicial and executive branches to change the rules of the election. First, on September 17, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, quote unquote, unlawfully and unilaterally extended the deadline by which mail-in ballots could be received, mandated that ballots without a postmark would be treated as timely, and allow for ballots without a verified voter's signature to be accepted, the resolution says. Second, on October 23, upon a petition from the Secretary of the Commonwealth, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled the signatures on mail and ballots need not be authenticated. And third, on November 2nd, the Secretary of the Commonwealth encouraged certain counties to notify party and candidate representatives of mail in voters whose ballots contain defect, defects, the resolution states. All of the changes are contrary to, to the Pennsylvania Election Code which requires mail-in ballots to be received at 8 p.m. on election day, mandates that signatures on the mail-in ballots be authenticated, and forbids the counting of defective mail-in ballots. The resolution also lists a variety of election irregularities and potential fraud, including the issues brought up by witnesses during the hearing before the Pennsylvania Senate Majority Policy Committee on November 25th. On November 24, 2020, the Secretary of the Commonwealth unilaterally and prematurely certified results of the November 3rd election regarding presidential electors despite ongoing litigation, the resolution states. The Pennsylvania House of Representatives has the duty to ensure that the, no citizen of the Commonwealth is disenfranchised, to insist that all elections are conducted according to the law, and to satisfy the general public that every legal, legal vote is counted accurately. Pennsylvania State Senator Doug Mastriano, a Republican, said on November 27 that the GOP-controlled state legislature will make a bid to reclaim its power to appoint the state's electors to the Electoral College, saying they could set the process on November 30th. So we're hoping to do a resolution between the House and Senate, hopefully today, he told C. Bannon's War Room on November 27. And that from the Epoch Times now. And that, that was yesterday, so we should be seeing some meh, something uh, according to that uh, by the end of the week, hope, or sometime bef before next Tuesday. But while all that's happening, Biden is working on his cabinet and also his comms teams. And it's funny, but Trump has an all female led communications team, yet the media is saying that. Biden was first. And got this coming from an article in BizPack Review, GOP women don't count. Trump's female-led comms team slams media for celebrating all female Biden comms team. Members of President Donald Trump's communications team criticized media reports that President-elect Joe Biden has made history through the first all female communications team. Media outlets reported Sunday that Biden's communications team would be entirely led by women, a move that the Biden transition team claimed is without precedent, NPR reported. Members of Trump's press team criticized this claim, emphasizing that the leadership of the Karen White House communications team is, quote unquote, entirely female led. The Trump admins come team is, com is entirely female led, tweeted White House Deputy Press Secretary Sarah Matthews. Listing Press Secretary Kaylee McEnany, Communications Director Alyssa Farah, Vice Presidential Communications Director Katie Miller, the First Lady Spokeswoman Stephanie Grisham, and the Second Lady Spokeswoman Kara Brooks. While apparently the, the achievements of GOP women don't count in the eyes of the media, Matthews added, the Trump team's comms team is entirely female led. Press Secretary Kaylee McEnany, Comms Director Alyssa Farah, VP Comm Director Katie Miller, 
Floater spokeswoman, Seth Grisham, 45. Second lady spokesperson, Kira Brooks, the third. But apparently the achievements of GOP media don't count in the eyes of media. They're coming in a tweet from Sarah Matthews. McEnany herself criticized the media reports, tweeting that Trump, Vice President Mike Pence, First Lady Melania Trump, and Second Lady Karen Pence had all had press teams led by women. The, com and the, the completely discredited Washington Post once again reveals their budding propagandist fake news proclivities, she added. And this coming from a tweet from Kelly McEnany. President Donald Trump already has an all-female senior White House press team. So does Vice President, so does Florida, so does Second Lady. The completely discredited Washington Post once again reveals their banning propagandist fake news proclivities. White House Deputy Press Secretary Judd Deere also tweeted, since I arrived at the Trump White House, a woman has always been my boss. First it was Hope Hicks, Mercedes Slap, and Sarah Sanders, then it was Stephanie Grisham, and of course, currently it's Kelly McEnany and, uh, and Alyssa Fair. I guess the media forgot. In a story that, that called the all-female press team historic, the Washington Post noted that male members of the Trump press team, including Deere and Penn spokesman Devin O'Malley, are quote-unquote regularly quoted. Unlike the team that Trump has chosen, Trump, or unlike the team that Biden has chosen, Trump's communication staff includes spokesmen who were already who were regularly quoted, including Jed Deere, the White House Deputy Press Secretary, and Brian, and Brian Morgan Stern, the White House Deputy Communications Director. The Post reported, Pence's spokesman is Devin O'Malley. Neither the Trump campaign nor the Biden transition team immediately responded to a request for comment from the Daily Caller News Foundation. Biden's White House press team will include. Ten, top campaign advisor, Simone Sanders, Biden's deputy campaign manager, Kate Bedingfield, and Jen Psaki, an alumna of former President Barack Obama's administration. And there's that, so, yeah, I mean, it just shows how completely one-sided the media is, as I had mentioned yesterday, you know, where that now we have the media gushing over Biden's pets, including having a pet psychic. And, and now this, you know, I mean, it just shows that the establishment is in it for themselves and not in it for the common people. As a matter of fact, there's no, no article better than this coming from Reason Magazine. Pandemic rules are only for the little people. The defining moment in the rules for the but not for me ethos of the ruling class during the COVID-19 pandemic may have come when Neil Ferguson, the epidemiologist behind Britain's lockdown policy, met with his married girlfriend in defiance of the restrictions he promoted eager to threaten the common people with penalties if they failed to socially distance, he saw no reason to inconvenience himself the same way, although at least he conceded that propriety required him to resign his government post when the trysts were discovered in May. He has peculiarly breached his own guidelines, and for an intelligent man, I find that very hard to believe, marveled Sir Ian Duncan Smith, a prominent member of the ruling Conservative Party, it risks undermining the government's lockdown message. Well, yes, but uh, but like all too many officials, Ferguson obviously never thought he'd be caught violating rules that he never intended to be applied to himself. And as we since learned, Ferguson's above the law attitude is common among those who feel entitled to red regulations and impose penalties on others for violating them. That attitude is obvious in, in Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker whose wife and daughter visited properties in Florida and Wisconsin, even as he ordered state residents to stay at home, except for quote unquote essential activities. My official duties have nothing to do with, with my family. Pritzker Huffman, the reporter, called him out about his family's wanderings. So I'm not gonna answer that question. It's inappropriate and I find it reprehensible. Now reprehensible might more accurately describe government officials who penalize the common folk for behavior in which they, in them, in which they, they themselves indulge. 
The word could also be applied to officials and hangers-on who try to leverage their positions for special advantage. That appears to be what motivated Mark Mallory, husband of Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, in the lead up to Memorial Day weekend. After his wife eased some of the travel restrictions he'd imposed on the state residents, Mallory invoked his political connections in a failed effort to get his boat in the water ahead of everybody else. He jokingly asked if being married to me might move him up, Whitmer conceded after the offended media, marina owner described the incident, which he found less than humorous on social media. He regrets that she added, I wish it wouldn't have happened. However, she did not clarify whether it was a power play or the marina owner's public complaint. For Philadelphia Mayor Jim Kenney, the it moment was a hearty meal at a Maryland restaurant, while indoor dining in his own city remained forbidden by his order. And it was somewhat upset that I dined outdoors at a restaurant in Maryland yesterday. Kenny sniffed on Twitter in August. I felt the risk was low because the county I visited had fewer than 800 COVID-19 cases compared to over 33,000 cases in Philadelphia. Regardless, I understand the frustration. A few days later, Eater Philadelphia published a long but incomplete list of restaurants that had permanently closed their doors because of the COVID-19 lockdown. The former owners of those businesses undoubtedly have plenty of frustration to share with the mayor. It was clearly a setup. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Democrat California, complained after a salon worker released video footage of the powerful lawmaker maskless and getting her hair done in defiance of the rules in San Francisco. I take responsibility for falling for a setup by a neighborhood salon I've gone to for many years. Maybe it was a setup. The salon owner is an open critic of Pelosi and her pandemic restrictions. But a setup would be possible only because the owner could correctly assume the House Speaker wouldn't flinch at violating widely publicized restrictions. As we've seen time and again, such hypocrisy is common. We are expected to suffer discomfort, economic pain, and emotional distress, or else pay fines and even serve jail time. Government officials, meanwhile, take offense when called off for violating the standards they created. The pandemic will eventually pass, but it will leave behind our memories of arrogant authorities who consider themselves above the concerns of the common people. Long after the virus is gone, those memories should stay with us as a vaccine against future trust in agents of the state. And that's so very true. I mean, you see, everything nowadays is rules for me, but not for the you know, basically the the government, the the establishment eh, writes rules that for the little people that they themselves cannot. Case in point with that is affordable care, also known as Obamacare, and a couple of other incidents that I don't know off the, top, off the top of my head, but if any of you happen to know of any, please place them in the comments below. And I'll be here bringing you the news and my, and my, and my observations on it. Yesterday was the, the Michigan Senate election fraud hearing, and there were a few takeaways from there. Got this coming from our good friends over at the Daily Signal. Four takeaways from, from the Michigan Senate's election fraud hearing. Election workers and observers presented alarming accounts of voter fraud to the Michigan State Senate on Tuesday with some calling on lawmakers to, to act and insisting on an audit of the vote in that state. The Michigan State Senate Oversight Committee held the hearing, which included testimony from a former senator with expertise on data and technology. The witness spoke to the committee under oath by, about voting by, by dead people, a truck full of ballots com, coming into the counting center long after the deadline, and vulnerable voting machines. The focus was entirely on the TCF Center, the convention center in downtown Detroit, formerly known as the Cobo Center, where Maine County votes were being counted. 
Senate Oversight Committee Chairman Ed McBroom, a, a, a Republican, suggested there would be future hearings to hear from additional witnesses on the 2020 election. The Michigan hearing followed similar hearings by state lawmakers in Pennsylvania, which certified former Vice President Joe Biden as having defeated President Donald Trump by thereby about 80,000 votes, and in Arizona, which certified Biden as winner by, over, by just over 10,000. In Michigan, Biden's victory over Trump exceeded 150,000 votes. Trump's lawyers did not testify in the Michigan hearing as they did in Pennsylvania and Arizona. Litigation also continues in several closely contested states. Major news outlets have projected Trump as a winner, but Trump hasn't conceded. Or major, major news outlets have projected Biden as a winner, but Trump hasn't succeeded or conceded. The Electoral College will make that determination on December 14. An email from the Office of Michigan State Committee Clerks that are written as a employee of witnesses with accurate spellings of names from the Tuesday hearing will not be made public for several days. Here are four big takeaways from the hearing. Number one, dead voters and vacant addresses? Chris Shornag volunteered with Guard the Vote after the balloting. It went through 30,000 of the 172,000 absentee ballots in the city of Detroit. He said the group found 229 of, those, of these 30,000 we went to were, were deceased. He added that 2,660 of them were invalid addresses described by vacant lots and burned down houses. But I can say for sure, and swear to you here today, is that overall, 8.9% of the, of the 30,000 absentee ballots that we've gone through and investigated just in the city of Detroit were unqualified fraudulent ballots that should have been spoiled. Shornak said. He extrapolated about how the 30,000 sample could reflect on all of the absentee votes cast. At the lowest levels, if these percentages carry through, this means that 172,000 absentee votes in the city of Detroit, 1,300 of them could be deceased, he told the senators. We are, we are investigating it, and another 15,000 could have been fraudulent addresses living as, or described as living on vacant lots or in burned down houses. Number two, a referendum with only two choices. Former Michigan State Senator Pat Colbeck, who has a background in information technology and cybersecurity, having worked for the, for the Defense Department, NASA, and other entities, testified that the numbers do not match up to demonstrate Biden clearly won the state, or at least not by the margin as it stands now. There's been a huge narrative around this whole election that says, number one, it started off saying that there is no voter fraud. Then the narrative changed in the media to say that there is no widespread voter fraud, Colbeck said. Then it changed into there is no widespread voter fraud that could impact the result of the election. He said voter fraud doesn't have to be rampant to be significant. If you have voter fraud in just one of our 83 counties, if that county is Wayne County, you've got an issue because over 800,000 votes were cast in that county, Colbeck said. That's much more than the margin of difference we are talking about in the election for the president. With the Dominion voting systems, he added, there's a transmittal of fractional vote data. You guys have done a lot of votes inside the Senate as I did when I was serving my two terms. I don't recall any of those vote tallies up on the board having a decimal point, do you guys? Colbeck asked his former colleagues, he also noted from his own observations that the voting machines were connected to the internet and potentially prone to hacking. Every one of, the, of those tabulated machines was connected to an ethernet cable, that ethernet cable connected to a router, that router connected to all of the other computers in that network, including what, to, what, up to what is called the local data center, which was managing all the returns of four 503 district with precincts in the city of, De of Detroit. What was further disconcerting is, I saw an ethernet cable coming from the wall, connecting into one of, the, one of these routers that was connected to the local data center, which was connected to all the tabulators and adjudicators. That seemed to indicate an outside internet connection. Now, of course, Dominion has vigorously defended its machines, stating on its website, According to a joint statement by the federal government agency that oversees U.S. election security, the Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity, and Infrastructure Security Agency, 
There is no evidence that any voting system deleted or lost votes, changed votes, or was in any way compromised. The government and private sector councils that supported this mission called the 2020 election the most secure in American history. State Senator Jeff Irwin, the top Democrat on the committee, objected to his former colleague's testimony. All we've got here is conjecture and musings by Senator Colbeck, Irwin said. Still, Colbeck insisted it falls on the legislature to act and push for an audit of the balloting. This is a referendum. There are only two choices for each of you in this context, Colbeck said. Number one, you believe in principle constitutional governance, and you believe that the chain of custody is broken. There is significant evidence of election fraud, or, and I'm not saying this slightly, there is an, there is an alleged coup. Number three, what an anonymous Dominion contractor allegedly saw. A contractor with Dominion Voting Systems, a controversial voting machine company that prompted questions from Democrats before the election and from Republicans after, alleged fraud throughout the accounting location at the TCF Center, according to a woman who says her employer works with Dominion. Melissa Carone, an information technology and cybersecurity specialist with PDS staffing, a talent acquisition firm that she was working with with, that she said was working with, with Dominion, asserted a Dominion employee claimed that he had been at a storage place called the Chicago Warehouse after she inquired where he had been. So it's in Chicago, she recalled asking the Dominion employee who's she said was named Samuel. They said, no, Melissa, it's in Detroit. We call it the Chicago Warehouse. I said, okay, and I just walked away. Come on, con continued. But there was something very really secret that he was doing. There was also, they said, a big data loss. For the 27 hours Cabone was at the location, she said she didn't witness a single ballot for Trump and saw ballots counted multiple times. What I witnessed at the TCF Center was completely fraud. The whole 27 hours I was there, there were batches of ballots went through the tabulating machines numerous times, being counted eight to 10 times. I watched this with, with, with my own eyes. Number four, a truck full and Xeroxing of ballots? Michigan State Senator Peter Lucido, the Republican Vice Chairman of the committee, asked another witness, identified as Michael Dubio, what time he saw a truck carrying ballots into the center. Like I said, three-ish, four-ish in that window, Dubio said. In the afternoon, Lucido asked, no, 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 I was there at 10 p.m. to 5 a.m., Dubio said. They were male slaves, you said. Did anybody have any earmarkings of who they were carrying the, those ballots, Lucido said? Were they carrying them? Were they on a dolly? They were on a dolly, Dubio answered. Do I know who they were? Absolutely not. State Senator Sylvia Santana, a Democrat, was skeptical about the witness. Was there any particular reason you didn't ask for a supervisor to question the ballots coming in on a dolly, Santana said? Dubio said, I don't think I needed to because the lead counsel that was supposed to be there was taking tally, and I was standing right next to him. So I figured he was kind of the person who was overseeing the whole night. That's what we were told. We were talking directly about where are these coming in. We all thought it was interesting that all these were coming in so late. We were definitely perplexed that they were coming in so late as well as that they were coming in to be counted. Patty McMurray, a, a Republican poll challenger at the TCF Center in Detroit, claimed she saw copies of ballots being made to increase Biden's vote total. Now, one of the ballots was a registered military voter and the ballots looked, looked like they were all the same Xerox copies of the ballots, she told the committee. They were all for Biden across the board. There wasn't a single Trump vote. All of the, none of the votes were registered, McMurray said. She said election workers and her names and addresses with funny birth dates that she said would override the system and, and allow them to, to enter non-registered non voters. Throughout the day, that's how they would override voters that were neither in the electric poll book or in the supplemental updated poll book, McMurray said. Now, based on this from yesterday and, and also from what happened at the Arizona hearing on Monday, the, I mean, there is something real shady and fishy going on with, with that and something just smells from there. And of course, the DOJ is not done in investigating the election fraud. Got this from the Epoch Times. 
DOJ not then investigating election fraud, spokesperson said. The Department of Justice, DOJ, issued a statement on Tuesday in response to the backlash from the article by the Associated Press, which quoted Attorney General William Barr saying that, to date we have not seen fraud on a scale that could have affected a different outcome in the election. Some media outlets have incorrectly reported that the DOJ has concluded its investigation of election fraud and announced an affirmative finding of no fraud in the election. That's not what the Associated Press reported, nor what the Attorney General stated. A DOJ spokesperson said, according to CBS News reporter Catherine Herridge, the department will continue to receive and vigorously pursue all specific and credible allegations of fraud as expeditiously as possible. The Epoch Times reached out to the DOJ to confirm the statement, but did not immediately receive a response. In its headline, the Associated Press twisted by a statement to suggest that the Attorney General has passed final judgment on whether fraud occurred in the 2020 election. Disputing President Donald Trump, Byer says no widespread election fraud, the wire service reported. But well, the AP's own article prefaced Trump's state comment on the matter by saying that Byer told the AP that the U.S. attorneys and FBI agents have been working to follow up specific complaints and information they received. Attorneys for the Trump campaign issued a response to Barr's comments, underlining that the many witnesses they are working with did not have, or have not been contacted by the FBI. With all due respect to the Attorney General, there hasn't been any semblance of a Department of Justice investigation. We have gathered ample evidence of illegal voting in at least six states, which they have not examined. We have many witnesses swearing under oath they saw crimes being committed in connection with voter fraud. As far as we know, not a single one has been interviewed by the DOJ. The Justice Department also hasn't audited any voting machines or used our subpoena powers to determine the truth. Rudy Giuliani and Jen Ellis, attorneys for Trump, said in a statement, several days after the 2020 election, by authorized the DOJ to probe any substantial allegations of voter fraud and noted that such inquiries and reviews may be conducted if there are clear and apparently credible allegations of irregularities that, if true, could potentially impact the outcome of, of a federal investigation or a federal election in an individual state. And that from the Epoch Times, who, oh, by the way, still has not called the election and they, and according to, to the website, they will not call the election until all legal challenges have been exhausted, which is, which I think every elect, which I feel and think that every media outlet should do. But you know, that's just me. And of course, what do I know? But Lee, comment below if you think that uh, that every media outlet should or should not wait until all election litigations are should be exhausted before calling a winner. And speaking of the media, you know, oh, People say that Trump supporters are disconnected from reality when really it's the media elites. Got this and one other article from the Federalist, which is a perfect example of why the media elites are disconnected from reality. But first let's read this article by John Daniel Davidson. With the end of Donald Trump's presidency fast approaching, we've seen a surge of columns and posts asserting that Republicans and Trump supporters have lost touch with reality. After four years of marinating in falsehoods and disinformation, a term with that, that really means information I don't like, Trump backers are all turned around, we're told. They believe much that isn't so. David Brooks of the New York Times explains that these poor saps, most of whom he says are uneducated, uncredentialed people who don't live in prosperous cities, have retreated to conspiracy theories to explain their misfortune and unhappiness. People in this precarious state are going to demand stories that will both explain their distrust back to them and also enclose them within a safe community of believers, he writes. 
Trump, QAnon, and Alex Jones rose up to give them those stories and provide that community. Now over the New Yorker editor, David Remick, ponders the grave cause of Trump's assault on, on the press and the truth, asking how many COVID-19 victims died because they chose to believe the president's dismissive accounts of the disease rather than what public health officials are, were telling the press. Half of Republican voters believe Trump's charge that the 2020 election was rigged. What will the lasting effects on American democracy of that dis what will be the lasting effects of the American democracy on that disinformation campaign? Now these are just representative samples, but across the mainstream commentary at the gist is all the same. If you support Trump, you're likely a poor person who believes in conspiracy theories and is dangerously disconnected from reality. Partly because you as unsuccessful people like messengers, books, books and remnant. You, you live in a fantasy land because it assuages your feelings of inferiority, which are mostly justified. You're paranoid because you're powerless and the alternate reality you constructed for yourself gives you a sense of power and agency in a confusing, unsettled world. But here's the thing. Everything these media elites say about Trump supporters can more properly be said about media elites themselves. Who really has been living in a fantasy land these last four years? Is it the ordinary Americans, including a lot of educated white collar professionals who voted for a president then they felt would shake up the sclerotic status quo in Washington, or a press corps that perpetuated an actual conspiracy about Trump media collusion for years? It was Remnick's New Yorker, after all, that published a serious seeming essay in September 2018 that claimed Facebook has been weaponized by Russian agents who wanted to sow political chaos and help Trump win in the 2016 election, an effort, the author said, that had an astonishing impact. Never mind the, the, the preposterousness of claiming that a couple hundred thousand dollars in Facebook advertising had an astonishing impact on the outcome of the 2016 election. There never has been a shred of evidence that a Russian interference changed or altered a single vote in 2016. A New Yorker staff writer named Evan Osnos wrote that article. Osnos wrote, won the National Book Award in 2014 and tw in 2015 was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. He's won many other prizes and worked all over the world. And just before the election, published a flattering book about former Vice President Joe Biden. Osnos is the sort of fellow Brooks has in mind when he talks about professional members of the epistemic regime. The people who know what's real and tell us so, a job for which they are richly rewarded. Now, what else has a supposedly enlightened member of the, of the epistemic elite told us? Well, in June, he compared to Trump's White House, which had a temporary fence around it after Black Lives Matter protests turned into riots, to the Zonghan Anhai, the seat of China's communist government in Beijing, where people are more accustomed than Americans are to the notion of leaders who work and live secluded from the public. Earlier that, earlier that month, also was dashed off a post I described falsely as it turned out, protests in Lafayette Square on June 1 as peaceful. We all know, even if the media refused to report it, that the protesters were not at all peaceful, and in fact were hurling bricks, frozen water bottles, and caustic liquids at police. Now this really isn't about all snows, his hackery notwithstanding, but about his professional class, a class that firmly believes much that isn't so. Despite mountains of evidence to the contrary, members of Osnos's class still believe that Trump got substantial help from Russia in 2016. They believe still that Trump is a dangerous authoritarian who, who might just destroy the Republic. And they believe still that the only reason tens of millions of Americans would support Trump is that they are racist or boobs or both. Osnos and Remnick and the rest of our media elites believe these things for the same reason Brooks thinks Trump supporters are conspiracy theory adult suckers. They're becoming irrelevant. They're losing power and influence. Their status as members of the epistemic regime is uncertain. Indeed, their entire regime seems to be collapsing and they know it. It's not much to say, quoting Brooks, that, quoting Brooks, that people in this precarious state are going to demand stories that will both explain their distrust back to them and also enclose them within a safe community of believers. So we will continue to see stories and commentary from the epistemic regime that will soothe men, or that, that soothe men like Brooks, Remnick, and Osnos, 
assuring them all is well, that credulous, mendacious Trump supporters have been put in their place, and that after a harrowing four years, all is once again as it should be. And now that's totally and completely true. I mean, it's, it's, this battle is the elites versus the common man. And I mean, I gotta tell you, you know, folks, the common man lost this election. It, it be, be because the media had its way and here's just one example uh, of the media elite and an aristocracy this also coming from the from the federal federalists and this from molly hemingway media says biden's female leg comes as a first trump has that now I had read some, some of this in an article yesterday, but this bears repeating. Former Vice President Joe Biden will make history by having a female-led communications team in, in the White House. The Washington Post reported on Sunday. The only problem with their claim is that President Trump's communications team is led across the board by women right now. Jennifer Psaki, a veteran Democrat spokeswoman, will be Biden's White House press secretary one of seven women who will fill the upper ranks of his administration's communication staff. It is the first time all of the top aides tasked with speaking on behalf of an administration and shaping his message will be female. The Post, Annie Linsky and Jeff Stein falsely claimed, and Pierre's Benjamin Swayze and Francisco Odonez also regurgitated a spin from the Biden team, writing that it would be the first time in history such roles were filled by women. White House Deputy Press Secretary Sarah Matthews, a woman, noted that Trump administration's communications team is entirely female-led right now. And there's a, a tweet for a minute. Let me hold on a minute. There is, there's a tweet that, that didn't pop up on the reader, but it says, the Trump, admin, the Trump admin's comms team is entirely female-led. Press Secretary Kaylee McEnany, comms director Alyssa Farah, VP comm director Katie Miller, Florida spokesperson Steph, Steph Grisham 45, second lady spokesperson Kara Brooks 03. But apparently the, the achievements of GOP women don't count in the eyes of the media. It's difficult to believe that the Washington Post and NPR reporters on the White House beat are unaware of the fact that women lead the Trump communications team. Kaylee McEnany is a current press secretary for President Trump, the third woman in a row to hold that office for the current president. She is also the third mother to hold that role. Communications director Alyssa Ferrer is a woman who has served in communications role with the Trump administration for, for more than three years. The Vice President's Communications Director is Katie Miller. She is a woman. The First Lady's Spokesperson is Stephanie Grisham. She is a woman who, served, who previously served as President Trump's press secretary. And Karen Pence's Director of Communications is Kara Brooks, also a woman. Anyone with passing familiarity with the Trump administration's communications team knows that. In the post phrasing, all of the top aides tasked with speaking on behalf of an administration and shaping its message of female, as Ben Williamson, a deputy advisor to the president, joked. If anyone, if anyone wants to know what it's like having women in leadership roles across the communications board, feel free to reach out to the Trump White House for comment, given that's been our setup for months now. Rather than admit that these stories were wrong and that Trump was the first president to have all female leadership of his communications team, Reporters pointing to lower level men in the White House communications seem to deflect. Here's Maggie Haberman of the New York Times, for instance, responding to McEnany's tweet on the matter. Maggie Haberman tweeted out, wonder how Judd Deere, who answers most calls to that office, and Morgan Stern feel upon learning this. Haberman could have emailed her call here and asked him where she could appear as his Twitter account, but he had already tweeted the following. 
since I arrived since I arrived at the White House, a woman has always been my boss. First they were first it was Hope Hicks, Mercedes Schlepp, and Sarah Sanders. Then it was Stephanie Grisham, and of course currently it's Kelly McEnany and Alyssa Ferrer. I guess the media forgot. The Trump White House would be well known would would be known for its high placement of females in key roles. If the media were even remotely honest about the facts about his administration, women have been many of President Trump's top advisors and communications leaders. Under President Trump, as was reported by the Federalist in June, for the first time in history, half its half of the senior leaders of the National Security Council are women, including three of the six region, regional directorates that cover the world. They include Dr. Deborah Birx, Alison Hooker, Elizabeth Aaron Wall, Sue Bai, and Joshua Neighbor, and all women. As Rebecca Heinrichs at Hudson Institute Senior Fellow noted, I don't think the male-female ratio thing is a measure of competency, but for those keeping score, for the first time in our history under Trump, our nuclear enterprise was led by two women, and half of the NSC directorates were led by women. The trumpeting of false claims were that are beneficial to Biden and, and other Democrats while ignoring the, the achievements of Trump and Republicans is typical for many media corporations. Many reporters alternate between cartoonish hostility to Trump and sycophantic obedi obeisance toward Biden. A few examples from Yamit Jalsindor, who particularly beclowned herself in the Trump era and others. Yamit said, tweeted out, it is the first time that uh, all of the top A's tasked with speaking on behalf of an administration and shaping its message will be female. Anna Navarro Cardenas saying, uh, posted the lyrics to Sister Sledge. We are family, I got all my sisters with me. We are family, get up everybody and sing. Biden hires all female senior communications team. Congrats, K Buds, K Jean Pierre, J.R. Saki, Simone D. Sanders. Pialito Bar 87. James Holman, historic all seven women, who are historic seven women will oversee Trump's White House communication shop, and Ilinsky Scoops, all of it highly respected individual. J.R. Saki will be press secretary, and Kabez will be communications director. Now, while it's lovely that all political media are so encouraging and supportive of Biden operatives, the contrast with their posture toward Trump officials is difficult to ignore, and it's not that there isn't embarrassing material to highlight for the new Biden team. This, this coming from, from a tweet from Matt Walking, here's Jen Psaki hugging Russia's foreign minister and Russia's chief foreign affairs propagandist while wearing a pink camera and sickle hat. Psaki was previously a contributor to CNN and might be remembered for her role in a scandal involving the, Biden, the Obama Biden administration's deletion of embarrassing footage from a State Department video press conference. So expect the media now, should, should the election stand and Biden take office, expect the media to be tripping over themselves and basically kissing up to Biden and, you know, and, and keep, in mind, keep in mind that this is the same media that had basically discredited and shot down anything that, that President Trump did that was good. Rush Limbaugh said it best, good news for Republicans, uh, or good news for America is bad news for Democrats, and good news for Democrats is bad news for America. And comment below for what do you think about the, about the media and it's, it's different. And, and and its attitudes toward Trump and, and, and Biden and basically toward toward Republicans and Democrats as a whole. And I'll see you in the next one. Will we see Trump twenty twenty four if Biden is inaugurated? 
Well, he had teased it, it yesterday, got this from the Daily Wire on Monday. I was going to share it yesterday, but I had run over, but this from the Daily Wire, Trump 2024, Trump tells crowd, see you in four years at Biden wins election. President Donald Trump suggested he would run for president again in 2024 should he eventually lose re-election to Democrat nominee Joe Biden. Trump told a crowd of guests at the White House Christmas party that he would see them in four years if his legal challenges against both totals and several states failed. The president's comments were caught on a Facebook live stream by, Oklahoma, by former Oklahoma Republican Party Chair Pam Pollard. It's been amazing four years, Trump said, according to the Associated Press. We are trying to get another four years, but otherwise I'll see you in four years. Trump continued to charge that widespread voter fraud awarded Biden and cost himself thousands of votes, enough to influence the outcome of the election. Trump's legal team and other pro-Trump attorneys continues to push legal challenges in several states over vote alleged election irregularities and affidavits of alleged witnesses to voter fraud and misconduct. It's certainly an unusual year. We won an election, but they don't like it, Trump said. I called it a regular election, and, and I always will. Early reports have suggested that Trump was considering another run at the White House should he eventually lose, a 20, lose the election to Biden. One such report said that Trump was planning to announce his 2024 run on election day if Biden is sworn in. The Trump campaign then didn't deny the report. As the Daily Wire reported, journalist from 2020, senior legal advisor and attorney to President Trump, said the Daily Beast report is completely false. Fake news media continues to frame the fake news narrative that President Trump has given up the fight for election integrity. Ellis told the Daily Wire in a statement Sunday, that is completely false. I speak with the president daily and he is focused on saving a great republic now, not four years from now. If Trump does run in 2024, early polls suggest he would be a shoe in to win the GOP primary race. A November poll said that a majority of Republicans would back Trump should he decide to run in the next presidential election. As the Daily Wire reported, a majority of Republicans and Republican leading voters would vote for President Donald Trump if he decides to run again in 2024. Trump is the 55 or 54% of those who were asked whom they would back if the 2024 presidential primary were held today, according to a morning council political poll released Tuesday. Compared to Trump, most other prominent Republicans barely registered, with the next highest percentages going to Vice President Mike Pence at 12% and Donald Trump Jr. at 8%. Congressional Republicans, such as Senators Marco Rubio of Florida, Mitt Romney of Utah, Ted Cruz of Texas, Josh Hawley of Missouri, Tom Cotton of Arkansas, and Tim Scott of South Carolina, each received less than 5% of the remaining vote, as did South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem and former ambassador to the UN, Nikki Haley. Now, that is a very interesting statement and one that might could lend some credence should things remain Biden's way, but we won't know. We we won't know unless there unless all the votes come in. But there is this from justthenews.com in regards to what I had just read. I'll see you in 2024. Trump teases president 2024 presidential run. The facts inside our notebook. President Trump teased a run to return to the, to the White House in four years if he doesn't manage to pull out a win this time around. The president, who has been seen very little since election day, hosted a Christmas reception at the White House on Tuesday evening. It's been an amazing four years. We're trying to do another four years, Trump told the crowd, which included members of the Republican National Committee. Otherwise, I'll see you in four years, he said. Attendee Pam Pollard, National Committee woman for the Oklahoma GOP, streamed footage of Trump's remarks live on Facebook, the New York Post reported. It's certainly an unusual year. We won an election, Trump called the gathering. I called it a little rigged election and I always will. Trump blamed the media, but they don't like that, he said. He also asked if people were watching the fraud hearings with his legal team. 
Referring to events, says Attorney Willie Giuliani has held with state legislatures in an attempt to challenge the results of the election, CNN reported. Honestly, this is, this is a, a disgrace, Trump also told the room. Just after election day, speculation began to swirl that Trump would run again if he lost. Mick Mulvaney, a former Trump chief of staff, added to the speculation on, uh, on November 5th. I would absolutely expect the president to stay involved in politics and would absolutely put him on the short list of people who were likely to run in 2024, said Mulvaney, now a special envoy for Northern Ireland, according to, according to the Irish Times. Joe Biden is 78, and coincidentally, Trump would be 78 if he runs for the White House again in 2024 and wins. And Trump is the odds-on favorite Republican to win in 2024, according to one bookmaker. While still refusing to concede the defeat this year, Trump's men may soon start tracking the 2024, Joe Shward wrote on Gambling.com last month. The businessman holds a large sway over the Republican Party and millions of loyal voters. So were he to run it again, there's little other than the GOP could do to there's little other than the GOP could do to stop him, Short wrote. Trump would be 78 come the next election, but as already proved the polls and betting odds wrong by winning the 2016 vote. At 10 to 1, it is not out of the question that the man who rocked American politics four years ago will be celebrating a second term four years from now. And there. Yep, and I didn't share it, but the links in the, the links down in the description. Interestingly, there was one other president that had lost lost re-election only to win it again four years later, and that is Grover Cleveland. He had won. That was back in the 1880s when he lost to Benjamin Harrison and then won it again. I don't have the years uh, on that at, right, right off the top of my head, but I'll definitely find it and drop it either in the in the description below, or I will even bring it up tomorrow. But yeah, so that's interesting, and in a, and going along with. With this election, Trump says, and this coming from our good friends over at the Daily Signal, election came under coordinated assault and siege, Trump says. President Donald Trump told Americans why he has not conceded the election in an unprecedented video message late Wednesday afternoon that he said, may be the most important speech I'll ever, I've, ever, I've ever made. The constitutional process must be allowed to continue, Trump said in the speech recorded at the White House as his re-election campaign pursued litigation in several states and state legislatures investigated voter fraud. We are going to defend the honesty of the vote by ensuring every legal ballot is counted and that no illegal ballot is counted, the president said. Major media outlets projected November 7 that former Vice President Joe Biden had won the November 3rd election by garnering more than the necessary 270 electoral votes. In the past two weeks, state legislative panels in the closely contested states of Pennsylvania with 20 electoral votes, Michigan with 16 electoral votes, and Arizona with 11 electoral votes, heard testimony from witnesses who allege large-scale election fraud. Concurrently, Trump's legal team is challenging the election results in those three states as well as Georgia with 16 ele electoral votes, Nevada with six electoral votes, and Wisconsin with 10 electoral votes. All you have to do is watch the hearings and see for yourself the evidence is overwhelming. The fraud that we've collected in recent weeks is overwhelming having to do with our elections, Trump said. The president's remarks recorded and released without notice to the White House press corps went for 46 minutes and offered the most detailed case yet for his challenges of the unofficial results. The Electoral College will pick the winner December 14. There is still plenty of time to certify the correct winner of an election, and, and that's what we are still fighting to do, Trump said. But no matter what happens, when witnesses see fraud, when they see false votes, and when those votes number far more than is necessary, you can't let another person steal that election from you. Trump said that while I don't mind if I lose an election, he doesn't want to see an election stolen. He said our election system is now in a coordinated assault and siege. Ultimately, I'm prepared to accept any accurate election result, and I hope that Joe Biden is as well, Trump said. However, he said, if we are right about the fraud, Joe Biden cannot be president. We are talking about hundreds of thousands of votes. 
We're talking about numbers like nobody has ever seen before. Trump complained about the risk inherent in, in mail-in voting and early voting well before the campaign's final weeks, as well as lack of safeguards against voter fraud. We used to have, we used to have what was called election day. Now we have election weeks and months and lots of bad things happened during this ridiculous amount of time, especially when you had the, to do almost nothing to exercise the greatest privilege, the right to vote, Trump said. The president, the president also spoke more about Biden. My opponent was told to stay away, don't campaign, we don't need you, we you got it, Trump said. In fact, they were acting like they already knew what the outcome was going into or was going to be. They had it covered and perhaps they did. Very sadly for, for a country, it was all very, very strange. And yes, it is very strange and very odd, but you know, it's America and we have about another five days until the state legislatures put up their their electors and then and then about six days later on December 14 will be when the the electors cast their their votes in their respective state capitals. So things should be interesting as we as we wind wind down the year. But if anything the that had been going on during this th these past four years is the whole thing with Jeffrey Epstein and I and he had died last year but there and there is a lot going on with his black book and Epstein Island which is a a pedophile's paradise. As a matter of fact, got this from theblaze.com. Bill Clinton's former right-hand right man claims the president visited Epstein's Island in 2003. Doug Band, longtime counselor and friend of former President Bill Clinton, claimed recently that Clinton in fact did deceased did in fact visit deceased convicted pedophile Jeffrey Epstein's infamous private island, an accusation that Clinton has repeatedly denied for decades. What are the details? The claim appears in a lengthy Vanity Fair feature story about the band's time working with Clinton, titled Confessions of, an, of a Clinton World Exile, written by Gabriel Sherman. In the article, band discloses a great deal about Clinton's life and work post presidency including details about the Clinton Foundation and the Clinton Global Initiative. But perhaps the most relevant bit of information relates to Clinton's supposed visit to Little St. James, Epstein's private 70 acre island in the Caribbean, where it has long been surmised that the accused sex trafficker and his guests would engage in acts of pedophilia. Here's an excerpt from the article where Sherman outlined Clinton's work and relationship with Epstein, according to Ben, with the specific accusation in bold, Ban told me he had been trying to push Epstein out of Clinton's orbit ever since their much discussed 2002 trip to Africa. Aboard Epstein's 5727, dubbed the Lolita Express, Ban recalled that Epstein had made a bunch of ridiculous claims on the trip, like boasting that he invented the, the derivatives market. Ban said he had no idea about Epstein's sex claims back then, but got enough bad vibes that he advised Clinton to end the relationship. But Clinton continued to socialize with Epstein and take his money. In 2006, Epstein donated $25,000 to the Clinton Foundation. Clinton made more than two dozen trips on Epstein's set around this time, Epstein's flight log show. In January 2003, according to Ban, Clinton visited Epstein's private Caribbean island in Little St. James. Ban said it was one of the few trips he declined to go on in his time with Clinton. A Clinton spokesperson said the president had never been to the island and provided detailed travel log entries of the period in question that did not contain a visit. Wow. Doug Band, Bill Clinton's former right hand man, says Clinton visited Jeff Jeffrey Epstein's Seven Island, which Clinton has repeatedly denied. Business Insider legal reporter Jacob Shamsian tweeted regarding the news, and there is a a tweet which 
which was if we click on the on the link there and while we're waiting what else Bain's assertion that follows similar accusations found in unsealed court documents involving Epstein and alleged co accomplice Ghislaine Maxwell in which their witnesses claim that Clinton visited the island accompanied by young girls. The information became public after a federal judge ruled in July that the trove of documents from a 2015 defamation cases against Maxwell could be unsealed. By the way, Jacob Shamsian tweeted that out yesterday at 10.15 a.m. About, about Doug Band and, and saying that Clinton visited Jeffrey Epstein's private island. The information became public after a federal judge ruled in July that the trove of documents from a 2015 defamation case against Maxwell could be unsealed. Maxwell, a British socialite closely associated with Epstein, is currently being tried by the U.S. Department of Justice on charges of conspiracy, perjury, transporting minors for illegal sex acts, and enticement of a minor to travel to engage in illegal sex acts. Anything else? In the Vanity Fair, Sherman noted that Ban claimed that Clinton's daughter Chelsea had tied Epstein and Maxwell as well. Ban showed me a photo of Bill and Chelsea posing with Epstein and, and Maxwell at the King of Morocco's wedding, Sherman wrote. Chelsea remained friends with Maxwell for years after the press revealed Maxwell was a close associate of Epstein's. For instance, Chelsea invited Maxwell to her 2010 wedding at the Brick Astor Estate in Rhinebeck, New York, after, Clinton had, or after Epstein had pleaded guilty in Florida to procuring sex from a minor. Clinton had access to home to yachts and nice homes. Chelsea needed that, Ben told me, he added. And that's just one of many things now. It'll be interesting to see, it, you know, just what comes out of this because it, it says here that Maxwell is currently being tried by the U.S. Department of Justice, which right now is run by Bill Barr. And we know that with a few cabinet members, I, I know that there have been a few holdovers, but we do know that the attorney general changes within, you know, from, from one administration to the next. So it'll be interesting to see just what will happen when Biden takes office. And let me know what you think about that in the comments below. Also, let me know where, if you think if you think and possibly support Trump running in 2024. And I will see you in the next video. Yesterday was the hearing for, from the Georgia Senate on the election fraud. And there are some highlights from there. This coming from the, the Daily Signal. Pretty long, so I'll just highlight some of the, I'll, I'll just read a couple of paragraphs from the highlights. It says that the Trump campaign's legal team described suitcases full of ballots Thursday in presentations to Georgia state lawmakers that included a video and a call for, and a call for the, the, the legislators to appoint electors to vote for the president. Other Georgia state and local officials, meanwhile, say the November 3rd election ran smoothly in the Peach State with no widespread voter fraud. In back-to-back -back hearings at the Capitol in Atlanta, the state Senate's government oversight and judiciary committees sorted through controversies and allegations that emerged from the voting. State legislators and closely contested Pennsylvania, Arizona, and Michigan also held election-related hearings this week. The Trump legal team has filed court challenges in those states as well as in Wisconsin and Nevada. Trump campaign lawyers also made arguments Thursday in a Nevada court, challenging the results in that state and calling witnesses to present evidence. Here are highlights from two from the two Georgia hearings. Number one, suitcases full of ballots. Major media outlets on November 7th projected Joe Biden as the winner of the election saying the former vice president had garnered more than the necessary 270 electoral votes, 
But President Donald Trump hasn't conceded as his campaign pursues legal options. Now the electoral college votes December 14, and those electoral votes are set to be counted officially by Congress on January 6. The Trump legal team in Georgia made a video presentation of what the lawyers described as and what appeared to be continued vote counting after the process supposedly had stopped. Goes on to say that Jackie Pick, who, who narrated the Trump team's video presentation to the Judiciary Committee, asked, asked the lawmakers what are those ballot, what are these ballots when they're separate from all the other ballots? And why are they the only and why are they only counting them when the place is cleared out with no witnesses? That in reference to a video but appearing to show election workers. Evidently unaware or not caring that cameras were still running, pulling four suitcases out from under tables after others had, had left the room. There's a video on that from Team Trump. And it says those machines can process about 3,000 ballots per hour. You have multiple machines there. They're there for two hours, so you do the math, pick that, adding how many ballots went through those machines in those two hours. When there was no one there to supervise, be present, consistent with your statutes and rules, to supervise the tabulation. We believe there could easily be, and probably is, certainly beyond the margin of victory in this race. Number two, water leak. About that water leak, Fulton County, the largest of Georgia's 159 counties, ran an exemplary election, argued Rob Pitts, chairman of the Fulton County Board of Commissioners. I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt there has been no instance of any unusual activity within Fulton County. I have personally have been involved in it, Pitts called the Government Oversight Committee, adding, has there been a situation from time to time where there is an issue with technology? Yes. Has there been a situation where there may have been human error as far as an orchestrated effort to manipulate the votes in Fulton County? That's not the case. I have challenged anyone who made the was made these allegations, come forward, bring that information to me, and I will take it seriously and we will get to the bottom of it. And there and there there are other things uh, said in there that basically there that there was a leak in the floor above where we were counting ballots at Safe Fem Arena. According to Steve Coonan, CEO of the Atlanta Hawks, that occurred at six oh seven AM November third. Pitt said at eight oh seven AM it was repaired within two hours. No ballots were damaged. He said no equipment was damaged. End of story. How this has gotten to be what it is, I have no idea. Number three, call to appoint electors. Biden won Georgia by only about 12,500 votes. Ray Smith, the Trump legal team with the Trump team's lead counsel in the state, reminded the, the Judiciary Committee. However, 2,506 felons voted illegally in Georgia, Smith told the committee. He said another 2,423 voters were unregistered to vote. 1,043 of those who cast ballots registered at a post office box and 4,926 voted despite registering to vote after the deadline. On November 20th, Georgia certified results showing the state went for Biden. Because of the irregularities and abject failure of the Secretary of State of this date and the counties that properly conduct the election, it is impossible to certify the results of the 2020 presidential election, Smith told the lawmakers. Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger is a Republican, but has drawn fire from Trump supporters for saying the state's election operations went smoothly. Smith said 10,315 ballots appeared to be cast by voters who were dead by election day, and another 395 voters cast ballots in Georgia and another state, which if true could violate at least two state laws. Smith also asserted that 15,700 individuals had filed a change of address with the U.S. Postal Service before November 3rd and 40,279 voted after moving across county lines at least 30 days before Election Day without registering in their new county. The Trump campaign's legal team filed suit in Lee County. Superior Court contesting the outcome in Georgia, he said. And it goes on to say Georgia has 16 electoral votes. State Senator Elena Perry, a Democrat, objected to the idea of the legislature's taking advantage of its ability to name a new set of electors, presumably for Trump and not Biden. 
I think the courts can handle this once you presented your evidence to them, parents said. As I'm aware, there have been 40 lawsuits dismissed already. And according to the law of the state of Georgia, we do not have the power to assume to submit alternate electors. The provision in the law is quite clear. Number four, no evidence wrong winner was declared. Georgia has some of the strongest election laws in the United States, including laws against ballot harvesting and accepting votes after election day. In Germany, General Counsel for the Georgia Secretary of State's Office told the Government Oversight Committee. Now, Germany said the COVID-19 pandemic created a massive spike in absentee ballots, which became a major burden on local election workers. However, he said the Secretary of State's Office did not find worrisome problems. We have not seen anything that would suggest widespread fraud or, or, or widespread problems with the voting system, Germany told the committee. The office has about 230 open election related investigations, he said. And it goes on to say that the, the Trump team has asked for an audit of signatures to verify the legitimacy of Georgia's absentee ballots. Germany said investigations occur based on complaints that cite evidence. So he said the Secretary of State's office would not conduct a statewide audit of signatures on all absentee ballots. We're looking at that from any individualized specific complaint that we get. I think what people are asking us to do is look at all of them, all 1.6 million, because some absentee ballots were in return, Germany said. Frankly, I'm not sure that's something we have the authority to do, he said. I'm not sure that's appropriate. We open our, our investigation based on actionable complaints. But State Senator Steve Gooch, a Republican, had a concern. We just elected the most powerful person in the world, Gooch said. How can we certify this election this week with knowing that a fourth of the ballots haven't been verified by professionals or audited? And Germany told senators that in 2005, when we moved to photo ID, this body on a party line vote went to a no excuse absentee voting that did not require ID. So that's our law. So that's how we certify it because it followed the law. And that's just one of ma many hearings that had gone on this week. However, regardless of what you may think, you know, fraud or no fraud, this election was not fair. And I mean, just bottom line, the, the fraud or no fraud, and despite what people say about this being a fair election, it really wasn't fair, as we see in the Federalist, and I'm having a little, oh, hold on one minute. This coming from Tristan Justice over at the Federalist. Long article, so I'm gonna highlight it. President Donald Trump has been deriding the election as unfair ever since the race was called for Joe Biden last month launching a series of lawsuits in Tiger Swing states decided by razor-thin margins. The president has now hinged his 2020 hopes. And I'm not sharing, hold on a minute. My te technical difficulties, there we go. Start, try it again. President Donald Trump has been deriding the election as unfair ever since the race was called for Joe Biden last month launching a series of lawsuits in target swing states decided by razor, by razor thin margins. The president has now hinged his 2020 hopes on the existence of voter fraud big enough to tip the outcome. Whether there was enough ballot corruption to manipulate the result remains an open question. When to be decided in the courts, whether fraud actually took place in an election with a record turnout in the form of mail-in voting. With last minute rule changes, there is no question. Fraud or no fraud, however, Trump is right when he claims the election was unfair. So instead, it was an open secret who corporate media was working from the moment Trump took office. Democrats took notice that legacy outlets were eager to amp up their retrograde conspiracies for claiming the president a covert criminal agent operating to undermine human interests or American interests. For years, the American people were subjected to nonstop Russia hoax storylines to introduce the Trump presidency establishing a narrative that would never die even after a two-year special counsel investigation debunking the entire theme. 
As the calendar moved closer to election day, the media didn't get any more responsible. Quite the contrary, liberal journalists con infected with Trump derangement syndrome developed symptoms that grew worse by each month. Moving, moving from one conspiracy to the next, first, it was, first the president was colluding with Russia, then the president was apparently working with an illegal pro, was working in illegal quid pro quo with Ukraine, then the president was apparently manipulating the, the operations of the, of the postal service and to suppress voter turnout in the scene stage out of House of Cards. Says here, it goes on to say the study from the Media Research Center out in, out in October, show that together. Facebook and Twitter censored Trump and affiliated campaign accounts at least 65 times over the past two years. How many times did each censor former Vice President Joe Biden? Zero. According to the report, 98% of the censorship came from Twitter. The platform first began fact checking the president on a pair of posts in May related to mail in voting, warning that radically expanding the use of mail in ballots could lead to a turbulent election. Twitter censored the president again several days later, tagging another tweet where Trump condemns the explosive riots erupting in the nation's cities as glorifying violence. You and you can see the tweet there. Twitter, of course, escalated its censorship as November approached. Meanwhile, widely debunked conspiracy theories surrounding Trump's dystopian manipulation of the Postal Service to secure re election have gone unchecked. Tristan Justice tweeted out this viral tweet alleging mass voter suppression orchestrated by the Trump directed USPS by showing mailboxes that have been there for years has still never been censored. Big tech's election interference came to a peak when the New York Post began running exposés expanding the, the public scope of, the, of Biden family corruption based on material from a laptop which received from a Delaware repair shop. The first bombshell report published on October 14 revealed Joe Biden has been lying throughout the campaigns that he had never discussed business with his son, Hunter who served in a lucrative boy position of a corrupt Ukrainian energy company while his vice president and father dictated White House policy towards Ukraine. And, and there's another tweet by Tristan Justice that's uh, still waiting on New York Times, WAPO and CNN to write anything on the New York Post. Actual bombshell on Joe Biden lying about what he knew was, of his son's overseas business interests. And Andy Stone tweeted out, while I will not intentionally, while I will intentionally not leak to the New York Post, I want to be clear that this story is eligible to be fact checked by Facebook's third party fact checking partners. In the meantime, we are reducing its, its distribution on our platform. And it says that the policies we wielded to justify their suppression appear to have been pulled out of thin air while each platform had put into existing guidelines, Twitter with rules against publishing hack content and Facebook claiming it must be run through fact checkers. Neither had applied the, the guidelines consistently because if they had, they would have censored stories related to the president's phone call with his Ukrainian counterpart. They became his basis for impeachment, the president's tax returns, Michael Flynn's phone call with the Russian ambassador, the, the DNC funded steel dossier, Donald Trump Jr.'s WikiLeaks emails, the Atlantic's anonymously, anonymously sourced story in, in September, charging Trump with, uh, with out of character remarks disparaging American troops, the Atlantic story about a shooting at made up, secretly recorded Trump audio, secretly recorded Melania, Melania Trump audio, Melania Trump audio and smears against the Covington Catholic students at the Match for Life in Washington, D.C. The censorship of the Biden stories, however, continue. The New York Post dropped its second bombshell report the next day on October 15, revealing even more or even worse details about the Biden family's business dealings. Emails show that the Democrat candidates that have personally raked millions from Hunter's China business partners with deep ties to the Chinese Communist Party. And Ted Cruz even tweeted, tweeted that out on October 15. 
And it says, when legacy outlets were finally forced to give attention to the post reporting, the corporate press fell back on their favorite narrative of, of the Trump era media, attempting to delegitimize the stories as Russian disinformation, if not out, outright claim that they didn't want to, just didn't want to cover the scandal. CBS's Leslie Stahl said information from the laptop couldn't be verified at Trump's interview with 60 Minutes and therefore CBS would not air the president's statements about the scandal during its signature program on in the final days of the campaign. This prompted the White House to preemptively release the tape, putting Stahl's bias on full display. Stahl also lied about there being no evidence that the, the FBI spied on the president's 2016 campaign. And Pierre released a statement telling readers that the taxpayer-funded outlet just didn't think the stories mattered. We don't want to waste our time, the outlet wrote. Apparently, journalism does serve a public coerced into funding the Democrat outlet. Masquerading as a news organization now is a waste of time. And the Biden campaign, mean, meanwhile, never disputed the authenticity of the laptop in question, which also had its contest re retrieved by the FBI as part of a federal money laundering investigation. But it was still a waste of time for the leftist editors at National Propaganda Radio. Instead, Biden embraced the baseless narrative of Russian disinformation, despite the claim having been publicly debunked by the FBI, DOJ, Department of National Intelligence, and the Department of State. Still, the censorship continued. And it said that the New York Post was locked out of its Twitter account for two weeks at the close of a major election, before it was finally given back access to its profile on one of the nation's largest online platforms. And there, the Media Research Center com commissioned a survey of Biden voters across eight swing states after the election, examining their knowledge of civil news stories the group felt the media had not fairly or adequately covered, including the Hunter Biden laptop scandal. I, I, I had gone through this before, but to, to reiterate, of the 1,750 voters, 17% said they would not have voted for the Democrat president-elect. Had they known just one of eight stories presented, Biden carried seven of the eight states where the voters were serving, including Arizona, Wisconsin, and Georgia. The president would have captured a second term had he won just 45,000 more votes across the tipping point states. And yeah, so, so you have that, but I mean, it just goes to show why Andrew Breitbart always said the new media Citizen journalism is taking over where the old media failed. And that's why I consider myself an Andrew Breitbart conservative. I'll get into that uh, possibly in an editorial series coming up, probably about the beginning of, of, of the year. I'll go into that. But yeah, and oh, by the way, did you hear this about Biden? He saying some saying what should have been quiet out loud. This I got two articles on that. One from Red State and one from BizPack. I'll read the Red State one first. Did Biden just say the quiet part out loud? I'll develop some disease and say I have to resign. Joe Biden did an interview with CNN's Jake Tapper with Kamala Harris in tow. As expected, there were no particularly tough questions. Time for the media to go into their slumber and or coddling of Democrats. As we reported, Biden declared that he would ask for people to wear masks in his first 100 days. Stunning and brave, and how is this different from what we've been doing for the last 162 days? Biden also detailed how he supposedly broke his foot while playing with his dog. He has been permanently sporting a big boot on his right foot because of the hairline fractures. There is a tweet from Daily Caller, Biden explains his foot injury. I'm walking through this little alleyway to get to the bedroom and I grabbed the ball like this and he ran and I was joking running after him to grab his tail. And what happened was he slipped on his throw bug and I tripped on the rug he slid on. There's a video to that, but Joe being Joe, Biden still managed to get in some strange comments anyway, despite it being a largely softball interview with Jake Tapper incorrectly addressing Biden as Mr. President-elect. Biden was asked if he had disagreements with Kamala Harris on approach. Joe Biden is asked about his disagreements with Kamala Harris on certain issues. 
There's a video there. I won't play the video, but I will read it. Like I told Barack, if I read something when there is a fundamental disagreement, we are based on a moral principle. I'll develop some disease and I have to say, and, and say I have to resign. Biden said there was some panic on philosophy of government and said they wanted, and how they wanted to approach issues we were, we were facing. He explained that when they disagree, it's similar to when he and Barack Obama disagree, they talk in private about the disagreement. Like I told Barack, if I read something where there's a fundamental disagreement we have based on a moral principle, I'll develop some disease and say, I have to resign. Oh my. Now there's two ways of looking at that statement. First, that he was talking about how he would have resigned if there was any fundamental disagreement and how she thought similarly. Now, you know, she never say that. Look on Kamala Harris's face as he said that was something else. You know, there's absolutely no way she'd resign anytime soon if she were that close to grabbing the power she craved all her life. She looked at him like she was thinking, stop talking, you crazy guy. Second was just the words itself, that he'd resign if he, if he had a disagreement with her. That interpretation then played into the ongoing speculation that he would at some point step aside or be pushed aside for Kamala. Note, notice when he said that, Kamala Harris actually shakes her head, no. No, I wouldn't resign if we had a disagreement because you know she never would. Or no, you shouldn't have let that out that you're gonna step aside. How crazy that we're even at this point with these people. How can anyone put either of these two characters in any position of power? Biden uh, on if he disagrees with Kamala, this in the tree from Minnie Johnson, I'll develop some disease and say I have to resign. I think he's saying the quiet part out, out loud again. And Ian Michaels Chong tweeted out, Biden is, is gonna get ousted by the 25th Amendment, isn't he? And to add a little bit, and to add a little more on this, it's from BizPack Review, Biden raised his eyebrows with a quip about resigning after developing some disease. Democrat presidential nominee Joe Biden suggested during an interview Thursday that he'd resign as president, assuming he wins the 2020 presidential election. We're here to have a fundamental disagreement with Vice Presidential nominee Kamala Harris. Speaking with CNN's Jake Tapper for a softball interview, he'd been describing how, he, how he'll how handle conflicts with Harris when he blurted, blurted out the bizarre remark. And all as he continuously stirred his words and broke every rule of grammar possible. It's a matter of the thing we are simpatico with our, on our philosophy of government and simpatico uh, on how we want to attach, approach these issues we're facing. And so if I don't have, and when we disagree, it'll be just like, so far it has been just like when Brock and I did. It's in private, she'll, she'll say, I think we should do A, B, C, or D, and, I'll, and I will say, I like A, don't like B or C, and let's go, okay. But and like I told Barack, if I read something when there is a fundamental disagreement, we are based on a moral principle, I, I'll, I'll, I'll some, develop some sort of disease and I'll say I have to resign. What? Listen and take note on Harris's facial and movements and expressions. It's in that video there. I'm, like I said, I'm not gonna play the video, but you, but it is parked in the article if you want to read, if you want to take a listen to it. We don't have that, I'm, we haven't. And we discussed at length the views on foreign policy and domestic policy on intelligence. And the great thing is she has a background in the Senate on intelligence. On the intelligence committee, he continued. She has a background in the Senate on a whole range of things that are gonna be pertinent to what we have to do. But it's gonna be, I think it, I think so much is gonna be incoming, Jake. It's a matter about who, who, who takes what when. Okay, okay, okay. Now the stunning inarticulate remark triggered the same response as, as his remark two months ago about putting together the most extensive and inclusive voter fraud organization in the history of American politics, he said. This coming from a tweet by El Velasquez on October 25th, 2020. On Saturday, Joe Biden bragged about putting together the most extensive and inclusive voter fraud organization in the history of politics. Is Joe that dumb to admit his party is heavily engaged in voter fraud and can't win without cheating? At the time, many people assumed that Biden had been speaking literally and that his organization would be devoted to committing voter fraud. Similarly, this time some folks assumed he was signaling that he intends to step down sometime in the future 
or perhaps be voluntarily removed via the 25th Amendment to make way for Harris to become the president. This line of thinking fits with a persistent theory that Biden wasn't meant to actually be, be president. According, according to the theorists, his job was to serve as a figurehead to drum up votes, given that Harris is unpopular, and then step down once in office to hear the theorists say it. That was the plan all along. Look, this in a tweet from Jason Jay just earlier today. Oops, Joe Biden giving us a playbook yet again. First, it was the greatest voter fraud organization, and now he's going to develop a Z's and, uh, and resign for Kamala. That was a plan all along. Another tweet by Virginia Girl. People with dementia say things that they're not supposed to, but they're still true. This is a plan all, all along. Biden gets sick, and then Kamala takes over with Obama in charge. It's similar to when Biden was talking about the giant fraud mechanisms that they put in place. Becky Lou Outdoors said, I've been dating this all along. Biden gave away the secret plan that most of us have already figured out. Just listen to this man. Lord only knows what, what will become of our country if this really happens. God bless America. Becky tweeted out, yep, she'll be the first female president by default. This was the plan all along ever since the primaries. She was supposed to do, do, to do better, but the left didn't like her. She was always Obama's pick. And then Bunny One tweeted out, Already planning on passing the torch, you think he'll last three months? Kamala was caught on video saying she'll be the first woman president. This was a plan all along. Wakama Chronicle tweeted out, he's being honest whether intentional or not, but are people listening? I have been saying that, that this is a plan all along. He always said he was a transitional candidate. The latter claim is 100% accurate. I view myself as a, as a transition candidate you got to put people on the bench that are ready to go in. Put me in, coach. I'm ready to play. Well, there's a lot of people that are ready to play. Women and men, Biden reportedly said over the summer. Now, as for the claim that Harris was caught on video saying she'll be the first woman president, it's not clear if and when she said this. Moreover, she had been running for the office of the president before Biden won the nomination this past summer. The CNN interview with Biden came four days after a doctor scan confirmed that he had fractured his right foot while reportedly playing with one of his dogs. And I gone gone through that from the Daily Caller. Biden, Biden explaining his foot, his foot injury by walking through this little alleyway to get to the bedroom. And he grabbed the ball, ran, ran after, running after his dog and the dog ran. Biden ran after the, the, the dog to, to grab his tail. What happened was the dog slipped on his throw rug and Biden tripped on the rug he slid on. You know, it's not clear why a home would, would contain an alleyway. John N. at Chap Soul tweeted out, he's got alleyways in, in his home. And Tumago96 tweeted out, come on, man, it was a thing. Ran in, into the alley with corn pop. Now, I don't know about that, but, you know, I mean, it, it's just intriguing how it is. And, you know, as I've been saying over the past few, over the past couple of weeks or so, the, the electors are slated to be named on the eighth in each state with the electoral with those electors voting in their state capitals on December 14, and the Senate and the Senate quote unquote certifying them on January 6, 2021. So it'll be interesting, and I'll be here bringing it to you live. And in the comment below, let me know what what you think about what Biden said. Also, let me know what you think about whether there is voter fraud in this election. And and your take on the on the election fraud hearings in Georgia, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, and, and Arizona. And I'll see you in the next video. And that's going to do it for the news for this week. I am Mick Bulo. Again, if you like what you watch, please go ahead and hit the thumbs up button. Also, subscribe and tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell an enemy or two even. And I will be back next week. Until next time, peace.